I'm going to read his formal bio. And then I'm going to tell you what I really know about him, because I've known him for some time. And it's all good, Sean. Don't worry about it. Uh, but Sean Malinowski is the director of Policing Innovation and Reform at the University of Chicago Crime Lab. He uh, retired from the Los Angeles Police Department, where he was chief of detectives in 2019. He attended graduate school in Chicago and has been heavily involved with the crime lab and with Chicago Police Department since 2016. After spearheading an assessment of the Chicago Police Department's crime fighting infrastructure for BJA in 2016, Sean partnered with University of Chicago Crime Lab and senior leaders of the police department to improve the department's crime fighting infrastructure by levering technology and enhancing business processes to re-engage police officers in the fight against crime. Dr. Malinowski earned his PhD in public administration from the University of Illinois in 2003. He's a former Fulbright scholar and served as a senior fellow at the Homeland Security Institute at Long Island University. In 2015, he was inducted into the George Mason University Evidence-Based Policing Hall of Fame. That was well-deserved. Uh, now, just a quick couple other points, maybe two things. I've actually known Sean for quite a long time. Um, I got to know him very well when he, he was intimately involved in our smart policing project at LAPD, which you'll hear about today. But since that time, uh, I've had many, many interesting and thought-provoking discussions with Sean. He is a very thoughtful, uh, innovative, open-minded thinker, and you wouldn't necessarily expect that from a chief of homicides in LAPD. He's an amazing individual. And I knew him. I was at UIC as a visiting professor when he was matriculating there. Um, I didn't know him directly, but I knew of him. And I knew of him because people were talking about him back then. And Sean, for, for the people back then that were saying nice things about you, they were absolutely right. So it's really a, a pleasure and an honor for me to have a Sean Malinowski talk to us today. Go ahead, Sean. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're making me blush, Chip, and I appreciate <laughs> the friendship with you. I learned something from you every time we talk. So uh, I really appreciate you having me here today because the Smart Policing Initiative kind of opened my eyes to, you know, for the next, I don't know, I think we started in 2011. So, you know, for the next 10 years to what we could be doing better in data driven policing and, and evidence based practices. And, and I know that some people on this call were very instrumental in getting me that George Mason uh, honor that um, was very humbling to me. Um, but I'm going to talk about SPI today uh, a little bit. I'll, I'll tell you guys quickly, I'll give you a quick brief, you know, so you kind of know where we're, we're going today. I think in about a half hour, I can talk about maybe a little more. Generally, my experience with SPI, I'm going to go through a case uh, from LAPD that from Newton Division, which before SPI was called Shooting Newton. Um, and then I'm going to talk about LAPD's evolution th to data driven policing. But more importantly, I'm going to talk about not just the, res the result in crime reduction that we had, uh, which we were happy with, but also the resultant backlash that we had from the activist community. And it was like, a, I would say it's a cautionary tale about being tone deaf and insular in policing. And you know, most of the people on this call will know that a lot of times we're doing things in policing without asking people, um, without seeking their input. And you know, it was a big blind spot for me when I just thought we were trying to get better at our craft and we left a whole piece of it out. So. And that's getting input on the front end and setting up community dialogue um, because we're not always, our goals are not always aligned with what the community wants uh, when you start talking to people. And then I want to talk about the promise of some things. You know, I, I don't think that we're in a position where we have to walk away or should be walking away from data-driven uh, policing. And, you know, there are some people that think that we should just go back to answering radio calls, but but we know what happens when we do that, when we pull back. And what's happened, unfortunately, in cities like Chicago and, and other places, uh, we had a good track record here for about three years of, of using data and, and really uh, made some progress uh, when I first got here in 17, 18, and 19 to uh, 
bring homicides down from over 800 to under 500. Um, but a lot of that, and, and there's a lot of things that happened, obviously the pandemic and um, the social unrest that we saw in the city. But one of the things is they kind of got away from the core mission of, of, of doing directed patrol and other things. Um, so let me talk, I'll talk a little bit about what happened uh, with my experience in SPI. I think for people who are new to SPI, that might be interesting. And then I'll get into the meat of uh, what we learned from it uh, when confronted with, with it and some friendships that grew out of that that were unexpected, including with Dr. Tillman, by the way. So Chico Tillman and I are, are very close friends and I have learned a lot from him in terms of his experience with incarceration. And I find now that I have almost just as many uh, previously incarcerated friends as not now. You know, I've got uh, people in Miami that I'm working with that, you know, really turned their lives around. And, and I wish that uh, more practitioners could have conversations with, with people who've, uh, who were incarcerated and came out and, and turned their lives around so that they don't have this black and white view of people. Um, but that's for another day. So for today, what attracted me to smart policing in, in the first place is, is I was a lieutenant, I think, or a, maybe even a sergeant working under uh, Chief Bill Bratton in Los Angeles. And he had tasked me with, with trying to do a better job of getting out in front of crime. I think that's the way we would describe it. We felt like we did everything we could do as far as hotspots policing, and certainly George Mason and others contributed heavily to that. And then I met Dr. Craig Yoshida, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with Dr. Yoshida, uh, with his research background from BJA and, and the Department of Justice uh, under Janet Reno. And um, I, I partnered up with him as an academic partner, and he introduced me to smart policing. And we just uh, we went after it in a way that I think it was intended, which is let's get good research partner, let's analyze what's happening, and, and then try to do something in the real world and and prove or disprove that some of these techniques can be effective. So um, that kind of collaboration and uh, the freedom to identify innovative approaches and and using evidence based practice is something that. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be um, in an organization that was ready for that at the time. And, uh, you know, Chief Bratton really wanted that. And then we had the great fortune of having Charlie Beck follow up and, and more of the same. And both of them were very supportive of this. Uh, so Craig and I worked on a program called uh, Laser, which we thought was clever at the time. <laughs> uh, later was criticized uh, as being too... Um, you know, I guess it was uh, too aggressive is what just the title of it, um, because what it what it it was an acronym. And basically it was for laser focus on the the people and the places that were um, most at risk. And the idea was to extract. And we said that in the title, you know, extract the chronic offender who was and we know it's a very small percentage of people who are involved in the severe violence. So we thought, let's identify these corridors where this activity is occurring. Let's be strategic, not flooding an area with police and not flooding the area to make arrests, but let's try to use as much presence as we can. What we later during predictive policing started calling uh, dosage, you know, dosage of uh, minutes on mission. How much time did we spend in an area where we can reasonably assume that we're going to have crime? And then, you know, use some data. <clears throat> we thought this was, <clears throat> I'm just telling you our mindset. <clears throat> we thought this was a fairer way of enforcing things. Use the data and come up with a risk score on individuals based on what we've what activity we've seen from them in the past. And, you know, that practice was going on with corrections at the time and with parole and probation. And so our thinking was, uh, maybe this is a more objective way of doing it because, you know, otherwise the, the way people get on a top 10 list in a, in a particular division in a big city is by officers sharing intelligence about those people. And we felt like that was not objective enough. Like let's, let's be more objective, not, not a subject. So many times the subjective opinion of officers doesn't match up with the data that we see on an individual. So we got, into the numbers and we, uh, Craig and his team did a great job of showing us over the years, 
you know, in some really cool animations uh, of heat maps where violence was persisting. And we and we really focused down into Newton because, like I told you, it had that moniker of shooting Newton. And that was for a reason. It was the most violent place in the city. And um, so we identified corridors. We got very strategic trying to uh, look at street robberies and all the retaliatory violence that was going on. And just as SPI has taught us, we try to learn some lessons and use research to test practices uh, to see if we could, if some of these innovations were going to have legs. Um, and then we measured that performance uh, based on uh, our relationship with Craig Yoshida and and Justice and Security Studies, his company. And it allowed us for a period of time to get better and more strategic about um, what we were doing at a time when we were going through organizational change. And what happened is uh, there were some skeptics in, in the police department. Uh, you know, I always know when, you know, when you're at, a, when you're a Lieutenant and you're working in the chief's office and you go to present something to command staff um, that they're going to have to do because the chief wants it. Uh, and the person says to you, how long do we have to do this shit? Th then you kind of know that <laughs> they're not on board, you know? Um, but we were able to get, um, Newton Division uh, on, on board, and, and that's a great, uh, great contribution to Craig Yoshida. <clears throat> and <clears throat> they really bought in the command staff there. And so uh, we pursued this uh, research project over, uh, 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 over a year period. And it was offender-based and, and uh, place-based. And if you, just to go into a little background about Chicago, I mean, <laughs> I get into trouble with that all the time, about Los Angeles. Um, yeah, so Los Angeles got 4 million people. We have 10,000 officers. We uh, are broken up uh, into 21 districts. Uh, at the time, the, the most violent district was Newton. And so we thought, let's see if, if we can make it work here and reduce some of that violence and try to move the needle on violence for the rest of the city that way. So we did this. And it was at a time where we had crime reduction coming down for a period of time in, in LA. And we felt like you know, let's go to the place that is, where it's still persisting because we're running into this friction of, you know, how, the more you reduce it, the more difficult it becomes to reduce. But Newton was open territory. And if I could sum up what we were trying to do, we were trying to go from an intuition, intuition based approach to a more evidence based approach. We were trying to instead of having crime analysts, you know, I had the great luxury of having over 100 crime analysts in LAPD. Instead of going from query based, we wanted an alert based system that would, you know, surface um, trends to us. And instead of having stove piped information, we wanted to democratize the information so that everyone could see it in the organization. Now, the thing that was the mistake, and now that I'm talking about it in this context, is we democratized that information within our own walls of the police department. So we didn't share that. We didn't talk to people about where we were going or what we were doing or, or the algorithms we were using. And at that time, it was a different time in history. We really didn't think that people were interested in that or that that was our role. We just like, let's get better at our craft and prevent these shootings. And we also moved from having analysts be just map makers to have an analyst be more, you know, base, basing, uh, showing us patterns and trends. So we uh, enlisted the help of UCLA and, and of other places to start developing not just the laser program, but predictive policing at the time. And we got to be over a period of years, a very much data-driven shop. And, and you know how these things go. I think the pendulum swings and we're getting success and you have somebody driving at the top and all the people he's promoted, you know, Bratton were of the same mindset. Let's get better about the data. And so we, you know, we went for it and, and we did have good crime reduction. So, the approach was, and then I'll go to the results. Uh, the approach was, let's do risk-based deployment, putting cops in the right place at the right time. You know, I'm reading a slide from back then, and it says right on it, removal of impact players. And so you can imagine now, uh, after this is done, a person from uh, an organization like Stop LAPD Spying or uh, one of the other activist groups reading removal of impact players. I mean... Yeah, it is a pretty aggressive way of saying it. Uh, but what we were trying to do is take the people who were causing the violence and um, the very few people and be targeted about making those arrests and not just throwing out a dragnet 
and pulling everyone in. Because what was happening in LAPD for years was, and most cities, throw out a drag net and you drag people into it. And guess what? Who's in that net? It's black and brown people. And we're with very little evidence sometimes uh, that they're involved. So that's a piece that came back on us later. And then we wanted to do analysis-based goal setting. So not just let's drive crime down by, so we're better than last year, but Chief Brad and Chief Beck really encouraged us to set stretch goals. So what we're trying to do is get crime down um, through this process of, you know, a very structured process in every uh, division of, you know, gathering data, analyzing it, making decisions about directed patrol, deploying people, and then collecting that information on how they did and how much time they spent and how effective or not they were, and then doing that every day, you know. So it became this iterative process. Um, and what we found through doing uh, Operation Laser, uh, measuring what matters and focusing on outcomes rather than outputs. So it wasn't so much about how many arrests you made, because, you know, frankly, when, when we're in that cycle in CompStat and you're putting pressure on people to make arrests, um, they'll make arrests for you. But I, you may not like what you get. You have a bunch of prostitution arrests that may or may not be lawful. You'll have some minor narcotics arrests. So we tried not to do that. We wanted to focus on the outcomes. Do we have an absence of crime in the areas that we were following this? And, and are there any other... Um, risk factors that came up in terms of constitutional policing. What I mean by that is, do we have increased use of force? Do we have increase in complaints? Do we have increase in injury to officer or pursuits and those things. So we're, me we're measuring that versus the uh, crime. And also for the first time really in LAPD history, we did what I would consider now a kind of a blunt instrument survey, survey of the public. Did the best we could, a lot, be lot better ways of doing that. But how does the public feel about uh, what we're doing? And that kind of led us in this direction at the same time that activists were starting to bring it to our attention. We saw some, some things in the data that not all people in LA approved of what we were doing. And those who disapproved were predominantly in uh, the black community. And the difference was vast in terms of our support in, uh, in the white, more affluent areas and our support in the, in the South end. And, and it improved over time, but again, only uh, incrementally. So uh, what we what we ended up doing, I'm going to get to the results here real quick, and then we can talk about some of the pitfalls. So I think you get a sense of what we did. We looked at corridors. We looked at people. We uh, try to be surgical. And that's what this whole laser acronym was about. Um, and when we were done in 2012, we had a big reduction in homicides. So we went uh, down 56%. So we were, I think we were in um, about 32 or so uh, homicides, averaging in the 30s, low 30s in Newton a year, which is a lot for one division in one city. You know, um, if you think about that compared to another city that might be the size of Newton division, it's a very violent per capita place. Um, so we implement these programs, we, we drop down to 16 homicides. And that was an all-time low there. So from our perspective, you know, Craig, Yoshida, and I, and, uh, you know, the people who were in leadership positions in uh, in in the district, we're, we're very happy with that, you know, and we thought, and there's a there's also a, at the same time, reduction in shooting. So the effects are dramatic. Um, overall crime drops 19%. Uh, violent crime is down about 59%. And, um, you know, homicides down 56. So we're all kind of congratulating ourselves for this. And, um, and still, frankly, you know, the thing is, that is what I think we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be preventing people from being shot and preventing people from being killed in these neighborhoods. So, um, and, and I thought we were doing a good job of tracking the risk management factors and, and other things. But about this time that we did our survey and found there were these large discrepancies between um, different constituent groups, uh, you know, which which is something that we hadn't done before. I think because we were afraid of the answer we were going to get. But I had to admit that it takes a lot of courage on the part of Charlie Beck, for instance, to say no. Let's go ask people. You know, so we did that. Um, but at the same time, we started getting uh, you know little indications from the field that places like Stop LAPD Spying and 
and even our own police commission, some members of the police commission who were activists, uh, who really are our civilian bosses, uh, were starting to question things. And Cynthia McLean Hill was one of our, a new commissioner and a civil rights activist and lawyer, very difficult person to argue with. Uh, she and I had some, we had some disagreements early on because I was like, you know, hey, we're trying to save people's lives in the neighborhood. And then she was telling me things about that she didn't like about it. And we just had misconceptions on both sides. Now, interestingly enough, Cynthia McLean Hill and I are really good friends now. She, you know, was often a reference for me. Uh, and so we we saw our way through it. And in the end, the best I get from people, like even if I'm in like a national public radio uh, discussion with someone about it is, uh, OK, Sean, we believe you that you didn't have malintent. But look at these tools that you're helping develop and how are they being used? And so it did open my eyes. And that's why I agreed to talk to the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers when they were developing a project to look into data-driven policing. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, people were like, how naive of you to talk to this group of criminal defense attorneys, but I had nothing to hide. I figured, hey, I, I, I'll tell them exactly what I was thinking. Uh, come to find out later, I was the only law enforcement person <laughs> that that accepted the uh, to to talk to them. So maybe I should have asked around a little, but it was still a good experience. Uh, and, and I still think today it, it was the right thing to do. They they came out with a study out of a task force on predictive policing in 2017. The title of which, which I can send you a link to, is "Garbage In, Gospel Out." And so the premise of it is that. The data that we were using uh, was uh, data that was based in, in race-based practices. And so how can you use that? Uh, basically, they felt like we were doubling down and we, we caused our own feedback loop uh, because we were identifying areas that were <clears throat> at risk and then going in there <clears throat> and making arrests. And, and, and so they felt like it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, in fact, we weren't using arrest, arrest data that way. But I understand the point. And some of the things I learned is like from Cynthia McLean Hill and others is like we have a chronic offenders list. That term offended people. Um, I thought the term was not offensive because it's like it's almost displacing responsibility from. Well, they're a chronic offender. You know, they are just chronically involved in this cycle of violence. But that was offensive to people. And then also <clears throat> they brought up so many good points about, well, how do I get on this list? How do I get off this list? How do I, how long am I on the list? And who decides, you know? And, and so we did set up over time uh, ways to address all of those issues. And now LAPD uses that in their daily practice. And then we also explained a lot about the data that we use. <clears throat> but people are very, as everybody on this call knows, when you say predictive, you know, it freaks people out. I think that that term predictive policing while people like the alliteration of it, really didn't do it justice. And, and it really caused some backlash from people because they felt like, you know, they were thinking it was like Minority Report, that we were the thought police kind of arresting people before a crime occurred. So um, these are just things that we learned over time uh, and that we try to correct. Uh, but if you read that report, you'll see that uh, they talked to a lot of people and they came up with some recommendations where they wanted to call attention to how this rapid development and deployment of data driven, you know, for us, it wasn't rapid. We felt we were way behind business intelligence and other things that were being used in, in the, the private sector, but they felt like it was um, a racialized system. And I learned a lot about that. And I learned a lot about the history of policing from a different perspective from these criminal defense attorneys. And it really is was a worthwhile experience. And, and I also had some other articles come out that were written by a, a doctoral student. And, you know, I gave this doctoral student a, a lot of access to LAPD. She sat right out in front of my office. And when I was chief of staff, this was a couple of years after. And if anybody, if she needed anything, you know, I, I got it for her. You know, she was up in the helicopter. She was in CompStat. She was out in the field. And, and then she wrote a piece that was highly critical of what we were trying to do and kind of at least misrepresented our intentions. Uh, 
And you know what? I still am glad we had her come in, though, because um, I felt like some of the things she brought up, we we should have been thinking about and we weren't. Um, but I took I, as you can imagine, that was not a popular uh, thing on the police department when that article came out. Uh, and so this this is something that's worth reading. You just got to take it with a grain of salt. And I think the biggest thing that if you, the punchline on the whole thing that I would take away from it is I'm, I'm glad that we did what we did. I think we had fewer victims because of it. But if you look at, a, at what came out later in precision policing and, and maybe maybe even expand the scope of that, um, the piece we missed was engaging the community on the front end. And it would have been so easy to do. You know, we could have started with our friends and we could have expanded slowly into talking with the ACLU and Black Lives Matter. And, and I've seen this done very well in other places now, you know, um, as policies are coming out, uh, there's a time, there's a period of time where people can comment on it. And so I don't think we are as insular as we were, but, uh, and I hope I wasn't too defensive about what we did in LA, but um, certainly there were lessons to be learned and, and, and we were all better for it in the end. And, um, you know, I'm still open to learning. Uh, so that's kind of what I wanted to go over. I, I thought I wanted to leave some time here. It's 1230. Thought I'd leave some time if there's dialogue or questions from people. And uh, the the fortunate thing is I'm no longer with the LAPD, so I can answer these questions uh, that you may have without fear of retribution. And I have my new boss here, uh, uh, Rosanna Ander from the University of Chicago, and she's much tougher than these other guys, than Bratton and Beck and the rest of them. But um, so if you have any questions, Rosanna, uh, I'm, I'm open to that as well. So Chip, that's where I'm going to end it. I think, unless you think I missed something. Uh, Sean, I don't think you missed anything. I just, uh, I appreciated the thoughtful kind of retrospective look at, uh, smart policing in LA and what, you know, kind of where you went personally from that experience. I, I think that's, maybe one of the untold stories about smart policing is that we do do great things with and for police agencies and communities around the country. But I think people benefit personally and professionally from their involvement with smart policing above and beyond, you know, the, the day-to-day grind of, you know, implementing programs and solving problems and things like that. So, um, just a really nice perspective from you, Sean. Much, much appreciated. And um, nice uh, compliment to Chico Tillman yesterday. So I really, um, I, 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 he, he, and I, he and I uh, have these discussions all the time, Chip, in terms of like, you know, controversial issues between, you know, everything from like stop and frisk and, and what it's like to be incarcerated and, and um, how cops view people who are, uh, formerly incarcerated. So yeah, Dr. Tillman, uh, I've gotten a lot from him, uh, over the last few years and, and consider him a friend. Yeah. So, um, I hope we have some thoughts or comments or questions for Sean, anybody? Let me see if there's any uh, ringers in the crowd that I can call on. Yeah, there's a, there's a question here from Joe Ballas, uh, okay. one, uh, one of our subject matter experts. Um, he says, I believe you answered this, but many SPI sites are implementing new technology to help focus on violent offender populations. What would you say are one or two areas to look out for during implementation? I think maybe you touched on this, but maybe dig a little deeper into that. Yeah, I, I think what I learned from the... Uh what I learned from my experience with identifying the violent offenders is that um, we have terms in policing that dehumanize people. Um, we don't even know we're doing it, you know? So, um, you know, when we describe someone, I still do, and I'm retired for years. And I still describe someone as a, a male white or a female uh, Hispanic or, you know, uh, and I think that's perfectly normal, as do my children, by the way, because both their parents are cops. But, uh, you know, I had someone tell me, look, um, I'm a, I'm not a female. I'm a woman. A fe- this is a female crab. You know, actually, it was Kristen Mahoney telling me that. This is a female crab, Sean. I'm a woman. I was like, oh, 
It is, but you just got to listen up for these things and how you're describing the, the violent offenders. Uh, you know, you got to go out to people and talk to people like Chico and, and other people who are out in the community who are experiencing it because we do dehumanize a population sometimes because we're just, you know, we're in, in enforcement. And then the other thing is if you're going to put someone on one of these chronic offender or violent offender lists, that person has, I believe, does have a right to know they're on there and they need to know why they're on there and how to get off. I mean, this was like a revelation to me when someone said, how, how, how do you get off? And I was like, I don't know, uh, don't, stop offending, you know, but um, that's too simplistic an answer, you know, and people would linger on these lists. And, and so, and there's a lot of other things like that in terms of people who have previous arrests and their, their uh, inability to turn their lives around because they're always viewed in that frame. So uh, those are a couple of things and, and just being really sure of the information you have before we take any kind of enforcement action. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, there's been all kinds of approaches to intervening with chronic offenders. You know, um, David Kennedy's work and, and other things very effective in, in the environments where I've been working. But then there's some offshoots of it where you have people showing up at people's houses with, with uh, large police presence and the clergy and uh, other people and, and doing like a, uh, you know, an on-site visit. And that creates problems for that person a lot of times that are unintended. And so I think we just got to be more thoughtful and get more input from community before we go too far uh, on, on these kind of uh, violent offender programs. That's all. Good. It, Terry, I see you have a question. Do you mind ar articulating that question for Sean? I, I sure do. Sean, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sean, I, I'm wondering uh, this the public trust issue. How do you engage the public? Which public do you engage? Who does that to explain why you're using the technology to discuss privacy? How do you get them on your side and who in the department is responsible to do that? And that's a that's an excellent question because when it comes down to it, everyone's going to point at the other guy. You know, I mean, you know, is it the public affairs person? Not really, because they're always trying to shape an image of a department that's not realistic all the time. I think the best way it works is the people who are actually uh, implementing the technology. So the people who are day to day, who's writing the policy, who's managing the operations, and then can we put them in touch with not our friends, you know, so, so like what we used to do in LAPD, well-meaning, we'd have a community police advisory board and we bring in and say, Hey, we're going to do more of these chronic offender stuff. And we're going to, Oh yeah, great. And, and by the way, could you, you know, check it those Winnebago's on my street? Cause there are friends, you know, who are all coming to these meetings. And what you have to do is identify people, um, you know, like Connie Rice uh, in LA, Charlie Beck and, and, and Chief Pratt and reached out to Connie. He's a, sued us. She was the person who was suing the police department the most. And they sat down and talked to her about how would you like to see this done? They hired Jerry Chaliff, who was the president of the local uh, ACLU chapter, to be in charge of constitutional policing in LAPD. So it's kind of that idea of uh, we, we can get people patting us on the back who are our friends, but let's get the operations people in the room with the people who believe that we're op oppressing them and have a conversation. And what happens most times, and, and I and I, get, I have a great experience here in Chicago where I'm out on the street talking to gang intervention people and, and we have people from, from the different, who, who've, who've had problems in, in their life with gangs. And uh, you get a totally different perspective, uh, but it's uncomfortable. And so I think we just have to rise up to that, that it's gonna be uncomfortable and there's gonna be accusations made and you have to just have to start the dialogue. Um, but I hope that answers. That's what my thought on it is. I welcome anyone else, uh, Chief or, or anybody else, uh, what your thoughts are on it. Hey, Sean, maybe one follow-up then. How, how do you in, uh, convince the operational officers, the street officers who do have a different perspective of how to uh, fight crime, prevent crime, how, do, how and when do you involve them in what the uh, command level is doing. Yeah, I think that's the hardest. I, I think, Chief, that is the hardest part because, you know, we can have lofty goals and we can sit down with stakeholders and we, we can come up with strategies and policy. 
and then it does it doesn't if it all evaporates before it gets to the beat cop uh we're going to be lost again and I, and I don't really know how to answer that except that individual leaders in those districts <clears throat> are responsible for making sure that they have to sometimes say the unpopular thing you know and and that's something I learned from Bratton is like when we had something that didn't make the department look good, he would come out right away and talk about it and say, we're going to fix it and rather than be, have a defensive mode. And, and the same thing with the officers, you know, the officers uh, don't want to believe their leaders are quote unquote selling them out. So you have to sell them on the idea. And, and I, you know, I think you can do that. I get cops, you know, if you remind them why they came on the job, I think um, that's been most effective for me, remind them why they came on the job and why we actually doing things that we're doing. So that, but you're right, chief, that is, that may be the hardest part of all of this is getting it down to the field. Thank you. Yeah, good, good, Sean. Um, if there are no other questions, I want to ask you something that's maybe a, a little personal and I'm, I'm not sure if the premise is right. So if it's not right, let me know. But in my mind, I, I think that there's, you know, when you come to a department and you talk about change and reform and research and community engagement, I think typically, sometimes, um, it's easy to give lip service to those notions and at least agree to say, oh, I'll go along with this. We'll see how it goes. But not necessarily embracing it wholeheartedly at the beginning. <clears throat> and then... I think in your case and in other cases that I've seen, there comes a point in time where there is a shift in your mindset and you're like, oh, now we're serious. And, and now now I, I, I get this. What, what does it take? You know, what operates there to make that shift in perspective, uh, the research and the data, the community engagement, leadership, all the above? I mean, how, how did you explain that? <clears throat> well, I think I can speak to my, in my case, at least, you know, I think the exposure to people who have other ideas, you know, even if those, <clears throat> even if those ideas are, uh, you know, what you feel are diametrically opposed to yours. Mm -hmm. um, that's what did it for me is like just being patient enough to listen to people and then asking those people to not, not paint me with the broad brush, you know, like uh, that I'm, you know, cause I'm a male white in my fifties who was a police for 25 years that I can't be open-minded, uh, you know, don't paint me with that brush and I won't paint you with the brush, you know? So, but it's a hard thing to have that conversation. And, you know, I have friends of mine, uh, like I said, on, on all ends of the, both ends of the spectrum here and, and they are polarized. Uh, I mean, there's some people in the neighborhoods who are never going to like the police and, and and they'll say, well, I'm OK with you, Sean, but, you know, and then I have cops who are getting more and more polarized. And and, you know, there's such a level of compassion fatigue amongst officers who work in the the most the hardest area uh -huh, of the city uh -huh. that I think it's hard to get them just simpler. If you're under pressure and you're under stress and you have trauma every day in your job and the people you uh, are encountering are also having trauma just easier for both sides to see each other in black and white. And what I would advocate is let's, let's give people a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. And what does it hurt to listen to somebody's point of view? You know, that's all. All right. Well said. And Sean, um, I think we're going to bring this to a close. So uh, personally, and on behalf of smart policing and BJA, and again, I'll go out on a limb on behalf of the people that are attending here today. Thank you very much for your time and for your